everybody. Um, today's broadcast will be short. Today is Saturday night, uh, October 24th, 2015. I will speak for myself, but I will bring my uh, an aspect of my higher self, so we'll see how it goes, but it will be me speaking. I bless you all. Can you hear me? Hmm. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. I bless you all. Dark energies are all over the world. Understand. Understand. It is a natural cycle. Nothing to be afraid of. A natural cycle. Every year the dark energy comes and the top of it is around Christmas. And then there is a symbol of death and a symbol of rebirth. And the Christmas is a celebration of death and rebirth. <laughs> it come, it's very ancient. It's very ancient. And understand that the death is rebirth. It is very spiritual. Don't be afraid of it. Don't bring it closer, but don't be afraid. Don't live in a fear. <laughs> understand that it is the life is still a mirror. Our life is a mirror. And in the past, in the bright times of the year, the bright months of the year, the mirror was shiny, reflecting shiny lights. Now it is reflecting more of the darker lights, of darker lights. But it is still reflecting you. So if you are in sadness, it reflects darkness. If you are in light, it reflects beauty. So be in the light. Be shining, choose to be shining, choose to be happy, choose to be smiling, and the life will reflect the bright side. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, thank you much. I have a bad connection, so I want to make sure. Beauty, beauty. In this darkness, the beauty shines most. In this darkness, look for the beauty. Beauty will save you. Beauty will give you strength. Beauty is very powerful. Search for the beauty within. Search for the beauty outside. In anything, in any problem, look for the beauty. It will give you the power to transform it from the darkness to the light. The beauty is the magic which will allow you to transform the darkness into the light. And in the darkness, the idea of God, the idea of God becomes more pronounced. When you are surrounded by many entities, many spiritual entities, many miracles, the idea of God as unity, the idea as of God as the only one. The idea of the God as a point, the pinnacle, becomes diluted. Now, in the darkness, it's much easier to connect with God as unity, to the God which is the one. The Father, Mother, one unity God. How do you search for God? <laughs> there is millions of ways, infinity of ways. One of the ways of approaching that is understanding that when you think of everything, expand yourself, expand your focus of attention, diffuse it to everything, diffuse it to universe, make it bigger and bigger and bigger, include everything which you can think of, that would be God. Right, so it's the biggest of all, the biggest of all. And also it is the smallest of all. It is one. It is undivisible. If something can be divided, it can be divided. So, so the God is something which is undivisible, undivisible, no, undivisible, the point, the pinnacle, the spot. So when you go big, you reach God. And when you go small, to the point of non-division, then you also reach God. When you go high, you see the next level, and then the next level, 
and then the next level, and then the next level. And you, you keep aiming higher and higher and higher until it becomes the farthest, the most highest point of all. There is nothing above. There is the top, <laughs> which is hard to imagine. That's not even a top. It is the vector, the farthest which you can reach with your imagination. That would be the God. So connecting this, the farthest and the closest, the biggest and the smallest into one unity. That is one of the approaches how you can connect. And then you connect with the word thank you. And thank you the one, thank you all, thank you my God, thank you creator would be the simplest way to connect. You are a mirror image of the Creator. You are a fractal image of the Creator. You contain it. You don't need to reach anywhere. You look for this spot, for this unity inside. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you much. Another thing I wanted to speak about is the idea of internalization. The life is very interesting these days, isn't it? Very interesting. So many opportunities and so many dangers. So many opportunities and so many pains. So much can be done and so much is already missed and passed, the opportunity has passed. So your attention is very often on the outside, on the external things. And sometimes you go and think about internal pains, your body. So it seems like it is everything, right? The world outside of you and the world inside you is the physical one. And what you often miss is your inner emotional life, your inner, inner emotional body. So stop and ask yourself, not how can I fix the outside world, not how can I fix my body, but basically, who am I? Who am I? What do I really want? What is that my emo... Hmm, no. What are my emotions? And what is my next step? in my emotional work. What are my emotions? What do I feel? Yeah, that's how you say it. What do I feel? And what is the next step in my feelings? <laughs> it's so unusual for many of us. So unusual. So look inside and listen to your feelings. And the last thing I wanted to speak about is about love. When you say much love, you say it so often that the meaning might be washed away. So I urge you, I call you, mean it, mean it. When you say it, mean it. <laughs> it's so easy and so difficult, really. When you speak about unconditional love, what is it, right? What is unconditional love? It is not doing, it's not action. It could be action, but it's, 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 it's a state. It's a state of the soul, a state of intention, a state of your feelings. 
it's more like a state of your being is unconditional love. Now, when you unconditionally love someone, do you have to spoil them? That's the question. Do you have to spoil someone who you love unconditionally? Right, so even if you are in a state of unconditional love, you still have to make decisions. That's the part of life. You still to have be to be responsible for your actions. And often when you're responsible for your actions, you also have to be responsible for reacting to actions of others. So sometimes you are, often you are in a state of un unconditional love and you still have to do what you have to do. So being in a state of unconditional love doesn't mean that you it will be nice to everyone actually. You are nice in a way of emotions but your actions have to be have to make sense, have to be practical, practical, have to be justifiable, rational, come from integrity, come from what you expect from yourself, come from what you believe would be better for everybody. And sometimes it is, often it is impossible to be to do in a way which will be better to everybody. So you have to make choices. Who do you involve in everybody? What is that your everybody definition, right? And when you speak, when you act in relation to someone else, you might want to think what would be the best action for this person. So although you act or from the place of unconditional love, you want to make the action which is best in the long run for this person and it cannot be it can it can be it it can be harsh although it's coming from unconditional love for the reason for the fact that it comes from unconditional love you understand you did your homework you went through and thought it through you might do some actions which might be perceived as not unconditional love and not love. So you're responsible for your state of being. You're responsible for thinking about what is best for the other person and placing the other person first and looking at the situation from their eyes, from their perspective and then deciding what will be best for everyone. That's love. <laughs> So being in a state of love is also being in a state of allowing and allowance. So you would allow many things which you wouldn't allow otherwise. Is love countable? Can you measure more love, less love, much love, less love, little love, tiny love? <laughs> is love sexual? <laughs> is it? It doesn't have to be, right? It could be a friendship. So mean it, mean it. Much love to you, indeed. I invite discussion. Do you have anything to speak about? Any topics? I have with me Ellen, Alessandra, Bianca, Ray, Shin, and Zach. Do you want to speak about anything? Can you hear me? How are you today? Hi. Hi. Any problems, topics? ideas, beauty. Let's speak about beauty. Okay. Uh, yes, you were saying about the beauty within. Uh-huh. And for me, I per my perception on the beauty within is 
is love itself, really. If you're looking for beauty within, it can only be love, right? It can only be what we are. The essence of what we are. That's what I think. <laughs> Yes. Uh, when I think about beauty, I think about being, about strong strength in the life. For me, life is beautiful. Harmony is beautiful. Coherence, which is agreement with itself. A crystal is beautiful. Life is even more beautiful than a crystal because it has much more potential, much more hidden energy, much promise. Yeah, the beauty is the promise beyond the promise beyond any rational, right? The beauty is the promise beyond any rational. That's what is the beauty for me. It is a miracle in itself. The beauty is a promise and a miracle. It cannot be that beautiful, but it is. A child is beautiful because you look at a child and you see the whole life in front of it, in front of the child. You see the potential hidden in a child. You see also many lives behind and many lives in the future. It is I forgot that word, is the point where many roads cross and come together. It's a point when things, I think it's called pinnacle, a pinnacle where things come together, a person, and then after that, many things come out again, many roads come out, and the future is undefined, and that's why it's so miraculous. When I think about beauty, I think about conversation, a conversation with God. You make a step, and the God makes a step. It's like playing chess with God. You make a step, and God makes a step. And together you create something beautiful. That is the poetry. In the poetry you can see the individuality of the poet. It is clearly the expression of personal choice. It is the signature of the author. And also you see the God speaking there. You see the words of God intertwined with the poetry, intertwined with the words of human. Same thing in the Bible. It is a word of human intertwined with the word of God. That's why it's beautiful. And same thing in the life. You make a step, your spirit guides make a step. God makes step, a step. Angels make a step, and you make a step again. So you play <laughs> table tennis with angels. That's how I see it. The life can be beautiful. And it can be not beautiful when you get out of harmony. So find yourself, find yourself. Find your purest note, purest tune, and play it. And at every moment it can be different. Listen to yourself. Listen, what do I really want? What is my next step? What is my bigger, ch biggest challenge today? And move in that direction. Any more comments? Any more ideas? Any more topics? <clears throat> do you have any... Um personal uh, insight into your view of love and how it would apply to anyone in the room? Ah. Uh, any more specifics? Um, is, is there someone in the room that, you know, could use your insight on your take of love uh, that could use direct message? All right, I don't have a good connection with the room yet, but I have a topic which is on my mind, and I want to bring it up. 
it is the idea of friendship it is the, yes it is the idea of friendship when you see someone beautiful when you see someone someone spiritual you might fall in a trap wanting to have sex with them and think about it think maybe it is good maybe it is good for everybody maybe it is intended or maybe it is just a cultural misperception maybe sometimes it is not a good idea to to wish sex with somebody beautiful and somebody spiritual somebody enlightening maybe you just want to be friends <laughs> that's a very simple idea being friends with uh, spiritual people is a great way of developing relationship and sex might be even spoiling that idea attraction is good but how much do you go want to go in that direction <laughs> now with romance it is <laughs> my understanding of sex is desire to have children I know it's 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 old-fashioned and it's not popular but I see true love as a desire to have children so you search for your perfect mate for your soul mate as someone who you wish to bring the children up with with with, with that person you want to bring the children up and you look for a best combination of your genes and that person's genes and best combination of your culture and this person's culture and when the life is more advanced like hmm, me 15 years ago my outlook at the love changed I don't know I maybe you're most of you are young so maybe you're not at that stage so that would be later but basically you look at your mate as someone you want to live their life to their old age and you look at this woman and think would it be would she be good a great old lady to live with when she is <laughs> 70 would it, would, she, would it be fun to live with her would she be a good wife and friend <laughs> of course I understand there is love beyond sex love beyond children and love beyond sexual love beyond the idea of time <sighs> that's all good uh, there is so many expressions some of that is common between us and animals some of that goes into biology and we can talk at length about this and again is it that we evolved from the animals and we carry something from the animals which is in us or it is the other way around maybe it is another way around maybe we are now we are in the now we are in the present and we create in the, the world around us an animal around us as reflections so maybe our animals are here to reflect to us different aspects of love the, the cats reflect the idea of independence and freedom the dogs reflect the idea of unconditional love And I don't know this word in English. Give me that word. Can you? Describe it. Um, yeah, the dogs, the love of dogs. I just don't, I cannot translate it to English. I never used it in English. Is it um, lo loyalty, maybe? faithfulness that's faithfulness yes faithfulness yeah faithfulness they're faithful <laughs> right 
Any more questions on that topic or any other topics? The romance in young age is interesting. There is so much cultural prohibitions and there is so much development, especially in the Western world, which changes things. Naturally, you might want to express everything as you think. You might want to express your inner thoughts. You might want to express your true intentions, but the culture demands that you hide it, that you don't express everything that you think, that you think much before you say anything. I'm thinking that we are moving from this pretense, this uh, delusion, this, um, how do you call it, deception, to more true expression, that we are moving towards trust and expressing your true intentions more directly. Of course, with, uh, with respect and positive attitude. I don't rush you to do that, but consider being more straightforward and see what how it will play out. Don't experiment, just think about it and see, experiment in your mind and see how it will play out. Accepting the one, accept, accepting another as they are is unusual, but that's also where we are moving. It's more enlightening. Allowing the other person to be what they are, and even if they don't, are not that spiritual, you know, respecting their choice and uh, looking for ways to make your ideas to them interesting is also can, can come out of respect. It's not from deception, but out of respect for their choices. Offering, your, you're always entitled to offer your service, offer your ideas, but if they are not taken, don't be offended, just say whatever, thank you anyway. And offer again, you're always entitled to offer. And another thing in love and relationships is especially, you know, the early ones, the early ones, but at any age, the early stage of the, of, of the relationship is meeting yourself. When you talk about yourself, when you introduce yourself, when you fall in love, that early stage when you learn about each other everything and when you are interested about everything about that other person and that other person is accepting everything that you tell them about yourself. You tell for the first time or for the first time or whatever, you tell what you really think is important about yourself. You tell your life story and as you tell it, you create yourself you discover yourself. That is wonderful. That is one of the most uniting processes, uniting communications, uniting events. Falling in love and introducing yourself, discovering yourself, uniting with another person, integrating with another person is beautiful. And as you discover yourself, you create something new, which is unity of you two. <laughs> I wish, wish you much fun and much creativity, much happiness on that path. Anything else you want to discuss? <clears throat> yes, this unity with somebody you love, it's... um. Some interesting ideas float around my mind when it comes to ideas around, you know, our spiritual work and, and ascension and things like that. Because as soon as you close your eyes, that other person 
is in a way with you. Let it be. <laughs> Where'd you go? <laughs> Welcome back. <laughs> yeah, like, as, but really, it's yourself. I mean, yeah, I've just been playing around with these ideas because there is someone with me which I love very much. And, well, I can't take her into my dreams often. I, maybe at one stage I will be able to. Things like that. Hmm. I don't know. Your your statement did require any comments, so I don't hmm. know what to comment here. I just want to to, to bring up one of my discoveries. I, I think it went through the whole life that you don't need the second person to be in love with the second person. That second person can be away thinking about whatever and you still can be in love and you have conversation with that person and you have all the complexity of relationships without even sending any letters, without even saying any words, which is <laughs> Which is not surprising, right? When you think about spiritual part of that, it is absolutely natural. You don't really have to be physically communicated when you communicate mentally, spiritually. You have the whole experience of relationships, of a relationship without actually <laughs> physically communicating to that person. And sometimes it end up, ends up wonderfully and sometimes it ends up... <laughs> with uh, pain and separation. Mm, that's natural. All right, I think uh, we're about to wrap up, unless you want to bring up anything else. Do any, does anybody want to pronounce any blessings? Bring up any blessings. I hope you are all blessed in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Wonderful. I wanted also to speak about Jesus. There is but one way to God, and his name is Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. No man comes to the Father except by him. All right, there is many perspectives on that. I want just to give a one idea which crossed my mind recently. So imagine God coming to the earth at the time of Jesus and knowing everything. All right. And humanity was barbaric at that time. Barbaric. There was human sacrifice and lots of other things. And there was lots of poor people, lots of inequality. It's not like modern world. It was, you know, some people were enlightened, but many people were in the dark. And then he has a choice, basically, what to do. And he can see the future. How can he see the future from that point, right? He is there with his disciples and playing in his mind different scenarios and can see what will happen after that. And obviously from that point on there was so many timelines because we still have a choice. So the humanity, the humans through these ages could make different choices. So he could see all different timelines. And then he created 
that situation which we know, right? The uh, I don't know how to, how to name it. The crucifixion situation. He created the crucifixion because that was the most enlightening, the most enlightening scenario out of all he could come at that point in our timeline, basically, in our reality. And that kind of spread the waves from that point on, and he could see how these waves were beneficial for the humanity. Like, the Atlantis was the highest point for the humanity before that, about 23 and a half thousand years ago. It was a different dimension, it was higher dimension, it was fourth dimension. It was higher dimensional reality. And then there was a downfall. A downfall after the destruction of Atlantis was very big. We basically went one dimension down. And he came and the things didn't look good at that time, right? The things went in the wrong direction. and he could influence it by self-sacrifice and crucifixion and and creating that Christianity thing. But one more thing to pay to to keep in mind is that it's his action didn't stop at the death of physical body or not death of physical body. Basically, the story didn't end. He was still here and he continues to be here as an energy and also. As I hear from many channelings, he also stepped down in, in different bodies and visited many humans and continues to visit many humans in many bodies. So he still works here through many ways. I, I believe Atlantis is a distorted remembrance of the uh, Garden of Eden. And as time passed one generation to another, the story became convoluted. And became from the Garden of Eden now became known as a, a blissful existence called uh, Atlantis. I hear you. I I would I, I, I don't know. Um, I would say there's no evidence for Atlantis outside the legends of man, and so we have to trace the legends to find a common origin. If we do that, it seems to point to the Garden of Eden. Um, my favorite story about Atlantis comes from the Earthkeeper uh, channeling Metatron about Atlantis. Um, there, there is a lot of truth there, which kind of resonates in many other channelings. So, so and, and Bashar also, and also my, my, my favorite, most favorite, one of most favorite teachers is Bashar. And, he sort of confirmed the the, the date 23,000 23 years ago about Atlantis and he reflected in many ways. One thing Bashar said was that uh, modern United States is the reincarnation of Atlantis and modern par, um, paradigms, dilemmas, the fighting, the Cold War in on Earth was replaying of the scenario of self-destruction of Atlantis many years ago and the same souls which destructed, destroyed Atlantis back then there was like several several parties which fought at that time and uh, was Atlantis, Lemuria, different parts of Atlantis, enlightened part of Atlantis and so on they reincarnated back all together and uh, and uh, replayed it and we continue to replay it but now we replay it in a way when we just don't destroy the civilization and we come out <laughs> healing the, the past trauma. So that is the Bashar story. For the Garden of Eden, um, there are stories which come from Liron channelings and channelings about Liron. So my understanding that it was beyond Earth. It was more like possibly in Liran civilization. So that story comes from before Earth, before 
Uh, it was, you know, the story that Lyrans were the first humans that came to our galaxy when the insects and reptilians were dominant, and that destruction of Eden might have related to this wars and some sort of that kind of interactions even before the Earth was populated. But again, I don't want to, to argue and also maybe there were multiple reflections. So maybe at some point the reflection of Garden of Eden and the reflection of Atlantis were united in some way. So I'm not saying you're not correct because, you know, it's really, there are many stories and some of them don't resonate to each other. So there are many interpretations. I wouldn't say that I'm correct in many, uh, or you're not correct or other way around. I respect your um, uh, insight. Uh, allow me to provide some information that sure, uh, sure, sure. That, um, uh, that gives us reason to believe that the biblical account of the history of the world and mankind mm -hmm. is actually the correct one. The Bible tells us that uh, Noah, after the flood, had three sons, Shem, Japheth, and Ham. And now if that were true, we should find historical evidence of, of this. This should be profound. When in fact we do. Uh, Shem was the father of the people uh, that came after him from his loins. And in ancient historians, even those who quote other ancient historians whose texts are now destroyed but were alive and well in their day, they quote earlier historians who say that there was a tribe of people on the earth once known as the Shemites. And mm -hmm. these became known as the Semites or Semitic peoples of the world. Today we call them Jews and Persians. Mm -hmm. um, now, if, if Ham existed, we should find uh, evidence of Ham in the ancient history of the world. And we do. Uh, the, the Hamitic people of Egypt, the Bible says that Ham migrated to Egypt. And it just so happens that the Hamitic people were the earliest tribe known in all of Egypt, uh, one of the two earliest tribes known. And they deified him. It's called ancestor worship. And they gave him the name Hamet, which is one of the oldest known gods of Egypt. Plutarch, the historian, said that the land of Egypt was known to the Egyptians first as the country of Ham. So here we have uh, verification that the biblical account where it says that Ham migrated to Egypt, he fathered a, an entire tribe of people in the very ape culture of Egypt itself. This is very early in the history of man. Now, son Noah had a third son. His name was Japheth. Now, we should find evidence of, of the same thing for Japheth, if that's true. And in fact, we do. We find multiple accounts of Japheth's name in the earliest nations, uh, tribes of man in the world. For example, he was uh, distorted. His name was distorted and remembered by the Greeks uh, as uh, 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 Priyapati uh, by the Hindus, I mean, Eupetos by the Greeks, Jupiter or Eupater by the Romans. And so we find uh, Japheth. Uh, we find his name as early remembrance in some of the most prominent early tribes of mankind. Right there we have uh, we have the Roman, we have the Greek, we have the Hindu as well. So we have fathers of ent entire tribes of people named after men in the tower in the table of nations given in the Bible, which is, tells us the origin of the various tribes of mankind on the earth after the flood. And the biblical account is actually supported. And here's something that's truly remarkable. If the flood of Noah actually took place, here's something very interesting we find in China there's a legend of <clears throat> uh, from Mao Tzu of China. He wrote that there was a man named Nuha, that could be Noah, who had a son named Lohan or Loham, and also a son named Loshen, which would be Shem, and Jafu, which would be Japheth, who begat Lama, uh, Lama, which would be Lamech, who begat Kusa, which is Cush, who begat Mizraim, which is Mese, who begat Elam, who is Elan, who is Elam, who begat Ashur, was the father of the Ashurian or Assyrian people. His name was Narkshur. So here, recorded by the Chinese in the very early history of the Chinese people, is the remembrance of Noah, his three sons, and their having been a global flood. And we find this kind of account in all of the major ancient tribes of the whole world. Now, this, this points to something very profound. The flood yeah. was a real event. Noah was a real man who had three sons who fathered all of mankind just a few thousand years ago. Be blessed in Jesus Christ. 
Oh, well, thank you. I think it was very interesting. Yes. Time. I hope uh, you'll consider the evidence I uh, provided. I could provide, if you allowed me, I could provide hours of it. But I, I, I will take my leave, and I hope you have a blessed evening. Oh, thank you. Mm. Very, very nice. Um, yeah, let's let's wrap on that. Um, do you want to give any more blessings? Oh, you just left. Okay. All right. Anybody want want? Does anybody want to give any more blessings? All right. Um, I bless you all. I bless my faithful <laughs> viewers, Alan, Ray, and Valerie. Oh, here, Valerie. I will hang up and I will speak to you after we uh, do the stop the broadcast. I, I wish you the balance, the health, and the happiness. I wish the life reflects your balance, health, and happiness. I am in love, and I bathe in your love. I send you my love. I send you my deepest appreciation, and I send you joy. Be in joy. Be in love. Bathe in life. Life is wonderful. Life is joyful. Connect to your friends. Meet new people. Step out of your house. Walk on the streets. Meet new people and say hi. And be open to meet new friends. We are coming to great, great unity. We are walking to the new future where the humanity will be much more united. People will be much more friendly. Let's start it now. Let's hold hands. Let's connect to our friends, to their friends. Let's connect all together, create a more united network. Be a light worker, carry light. Choose light. Choose happiness, choose smiling, and carry it to the world, united with others. Everyone has a sparkle of God. Everyone has a sparkle of love. Everyone has a sparkle of beauty. Grow it in yourself. Grow it in, in your friends. Unite with them. Unite through this sparkle of beauty. Amen. Okay. I'm stopping the broadcast. Goodbye, everybody, and I want to sp speak to Valerie. Goodbye. Thank you, thank you, Mark. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Marks. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Thank you.